if you can coherently and cogently explain, explain the social trends that are happening now, people think you're talking about the future, you're only talking about the present most of the time. That makes sense because historians need some perspective before they can go backwards Absolutely. and you're having to gain that at the moment. That's amazing. Well, you know, part of this title is from liberation to leadership. What do you mean by liberation? I believe that it is time for the women's movement to have a major shift in its orientation. Um, up until now, the orientation of most women and the, and the women's movement was toward liberation. That struggle will certainly continue. There are plenty of people in very desperate circumstances in this country and abroad uh, who need to be, quote unquote, liberated. But for those women who have a track record of 20 years in the world, I believe it's important for them to shift their orientation from liberation to leadership. Because until women start moving into the key leadership areas of the world, they will never be able to transform this world that we live in into a world where the voices and the visions of both women and men are heard and translated into policy, be that on the private level in private business or in the governmental level. Sounds like we're moving from defense to offense. Is that what you think? <laughs> I think Go back to a sports metaphor? I think that's very interesting. Very interesting comment. So very let's let's talk comment. about some of these ser these areas. Let's start with sports. I mean, women didn't used to do so much in sports. Now they're doing all kinds of things. And I think it's very much related to what you and I were just talking about. I think that we grew up, many baby boom women grew up um, on the playing field, very unself-confident in terms of their athletic ability. We didn't play sports as, as young girls. Uh, we didn't develop positive images of ourselves as being able to play, able to make mistakes on the playing field and have fun. And I think that as that group of baby boom women move into their 30s and 40s, as the vast majority of them already have, that they are subconsciously attracted to sports because of the lessons sports will teach, not on the intellectual level. Now, we're not talking about getting your MBA, but we're talking about confronting fear, confronting um, old patterns, bad habits, on a very physical and emotional and therefore spiritual level. Um, if you take up, I mean, there, you, you know the stories from women friends of yours, as I do, uh, a woman here in Florida, a Sukhab, an attorney in Miami, took up mountain climbing when she was 45 years old. Damn near killed herself. <laughs> but um, climbed Mount Everest and has that as an accomplishment was part of a team that um, got very, they didn't actually reach the top, but, but got very, very close to the summit. And we find so many examples, or, or an example of a woman who hasn't been athletic, who starts walking, who starts running. Five years later, she's run the Boston Marathon. And, and I think that, that we women are looking to sports to develop persistence, endurance, self-confidence, risk-taking, a lot of attributes that are really important and really needed for leadership. These are team sports or individual sports or well, all of the above? I'm glad you raised that issue because what we were told as young girls growing up, not as young girls growing up, what we were told as say 30 year olds in the mid 70s um, or 25 year olds or whatever is you didn't play sports so you don't know competition and, and teamwork and my point is that competition and teamwork may be all all well and good but there's a lot more that sports teaches those other great traits persistence endurance courage risk taking it's not just team sports there's plenty to be learned in individual sports Okay, well, um, I think that 
is it not too late then? It sounds like you don't get it in grade school or high school or play t-ball or start up in a, in a sport as a kid. You can get it later. It certainly isn't too late by any means. Six of the seven top most popular sports are dominated by women. Um, they include uh, hiking, swimming, cycling, skiing, and skiing and running, for example, are dominated by men. But the women are a huge majority. Women make up about 40, 42, 43 percent of the downhill skiers. They're, they're much higher in cross country, by the way, but of the downhill skiers and of, of the runners. And these are, these are women taking up sports much later in life. It is not too late by any means. I think the most significant sporting event, and I'm sure she would be shocked to know this, but I think the woman who won the Iditarod more than once probably did as much for women's self-esteem and, and ambition in sports as anybody I can think of. I agree. I think that's a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful icon for us to look at when we see that, when we saw that in the news and that grueling, grueling, grueling task. And, and how, how interesting the stories that I read and that I wrote about in Megatrends for Women emphasize her relationship with the animals and how she really, really could ask everything of them because she raised them from, from when they were born. Mm -hmm. So it's a very powerful feminine thing. And I think that, that one of the big parts of moving from liberation to leadership is recognizing the strengths in the feminine, the positive, powerful strengths within the feminine, and not for goodness sake, which we haven't been doing for a long time, just following that male model. That's get, that gets you nowhere, and, and everybody knows that. Uh, well, what kind of model are we following in politics? I think that in politics, we are looking toward women who are articulate and compassionate. We are looking toward women who can project a knowledgeable and positive image but not without caring. I mean, I think that, that even if you're a male politician, that caring element has got to come through. That's an example of how some of the, of the so-called traditional female attributes, and I always put so-called around it because you can debate from here until kingdom come about what male traits and female traits are, but, but we've got to have some kind of a vocabulary. But the, the fact that we now demand a male politician to show caring, um, that we would no longer, we wouldn't dream today, I think, of, of criticizing a male candidate for, for crying tears of compassion at a tragic event. Yes, even Bob Dole cried, I think, at a, at a recent funeral and an eulogy. And I think that that's probably something that we, he wouldn't have done earlier, maybe. I, I agree with you, and I think that that's a perfect example of fe so-called female values finding their place in society and being valued and, and esteemed as they should be. The honesty issue is so unique. I think women are being elected because they're not seen as typical politicians. In some ways, what they're looking for is somebody who isn't a politician, therefore, might be a woman. I think that's an excellent example. Caring honesty. Those two are way up there on the, the list of attributes that the voters are interested in today. Are women more honest or they just haven't gotten corrupted like the men have gotten in those positions? Well, well we haven't had a chance yet <laughs> to, to try that out. out. But um, I'd put my money on the women being less corrupt. I would too. I would too. Let's look at the area of work. You talked about 20 years of work now, experience, and being able to make things happen. What else is happening out there for women in the area of work? Glass is the glass ceiling one. there? Oh, the glass ceiling is there. The glass ceiling is there. But the big trend is in many ways in response to the glass ceiling, and that is that women are starting new businesses at estimates vary from two to five times the rate of men. And uh, as of 1992, two years ago, women-owned businesses in the United States employed more people than all of the companies of the Fortune 500 put together. That um, research was conducted by the National Foundation of Women Business Owners. I serve on the board of that organization, and I just got um, a letter just the other day indicating that they are going to update that research. 
The, the Fortune 500, tragically, are laying off hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people every year. And so as we move into the, into the 1990s and approach the 21st century, it will not surprise me if early in the 21st century, women-owned businesses employ twice as many people as the Fortune 500. Well, that certainly isn't the avenue of expansion. Is there, is there a trend also to put more women on boards of directors or to have them as top CEOs or women just saying, forget this, I can't do it, I'm going to go make my own fortune? The male-dominated business culture, especially in huge companies, is very, very slow to change. Yeah, there's change. Yes, as those baby boomers move into senior middle management jobs and senior management jobs, they're in striking distance for the top CEOs positions. But the culture of big business remains a male-dominated culture. There is no question about it. And you are measured by standards that apply to 60-year-old men who have had at-home, non-working wives taking care of them for the last 30 years. And this is no secret to any woman who's in the work world. This is common knowledge. But that's why I'm so excited about the, it's, it's, a, it's tragic in many ways that women have to leave big companies and start their own firms. But many f discover that it is a blessing in disguise because when they are at the helm of this newly launched corporation, they are creating policy themselves. They're the boss. They're saying, you got kids at home? Get a computer, finish the work at home? No problem. Just get the work done. Women are task-oriented. Get the job done, whatever else we can work it out. And so these new businesses, and, and male entrepreneurs are a heck of a lot more flexible than these corporate guys, too. And so side by side with this still dominant male corporate culture is a thriving entrepreneurial culture, including many, many women-owned businesses where change is happening at an accelerated rate. So you can look over here at the Fortune 500 and say, Patricia, you're nuts. Change isn't happening. And, and in many ways, I've got to agree with you. But look over here and look at the change that's happening in not just mom and pop organizations, but the $10 million electronics firm, the um, $200,000 catering firm, in these the small to mid-sized business, businesses that are growing, that are growing, that are going to be the Fortune 500 of the future. Are these mega trends regional or are they all across the United States or even the world? Depends on which mega trend. Well, the one I'm mean. talking about, I guess, is the work and the small, the women opening small businesses. That's all over the United States. There are certainly pockets of greater activity but that is absolutely all over the United so it's, States. It's certainly happening here, and I'm sure it's happening other places. There's also a lot of change in the area of medicine and women. Maybe you can catch us up on what's well, happening. Well, there better that. be. <laughs> it's about there time. There better be, because in the next two decades, 40 to 50 million women will go through menopause. That, those are huge numbers. That's something that the health care system has not faced yet. And I would say that if you're on the board of uh, a clinic or a hospital whose CEO is not taking the issue of menopause seriously and planning on totally revamping how it, it structures its services around this issue, then I would suggest that you fire that CEO now and save your organization, save your board a lot of aggra aggravation because catering to the needs of premenopausal menopausal and postmenopausal women and their specific um, vulnerabilities, including heart disease, which has been largely ignored until very, very recently by the medical establishment. This whole area of gearing up for this onslaught of, of menopause will be the areas where these healthcare organizations are going to be profitable in the future. So it's extremely important. Well, we're almost out of time, and we've got more trends to talk about here. So we've got five minutes to cover several of these things, and I don't want to miss them. Family. What's happening in the family that's going on now that we don't even know about? Again, demographically, 
It's painfully slow change, but change. The values and the attitudes of the 30-year-old male, in large part, are very different from those of the 60-year-old male. The younger dads are getting really involved in the family, wanting to, I mean, nobody wants to be a, just a total slave to their job. Everybody wants the richness, perhaps for, for certain years, both whether you're a male or a female, you've got to be full speed ahead on your career, but that gets pretty tiring after a while. And we are slowly seeing the values begin to change and people starting to care more about family and dads starting to, to become real fathers. So we'll all have more balance, not just women. We'll all win. Of course. That's really a good thing, good thing to think about. Um, well, I guess fashion. Oh, fashion is very important. Okay. <laughs> fashion is very important um, because it's so visual and because it's such a metaphor. For decades, women looked to European male designers to dress them. Uh, and they dress the, the ladies who lunch and the wealthy socialites and the, and the movie stars and the occasional American first lady. That was fashion dictated from the top down. Today, fashion is happening from the bottom up. The average working woman in her 30s, 40s, uh, rejects this silly notion of fashion. <laughs> She's turning to the female designers and making their careers successful. She wants clothes that are businesslike, simple, elegant, and it's the women designers who, who are supplying her. Um, Liz Claiborne, she's retired from the business, but it certainly still bears her name, uh, sells four times more clothes, women's clothes, than the top three male designers put together. She understands her customer. And understanding your customer, this is kind of a way to, to kind of summarize what we've talked about today, because I'm not indicating, talking about these trends just because they're swell for women. I'm also saying, hey, Mr. Businessman, or Ms. Businesswoman, look at your female customer, understand who she is, learn from her, and you're going to do very, very well. Women buy 40% of the automobile tires in the United States today. Women buy 50% of the automobiles in the United States today. Women buy 75% of men's clothing. Ooh. They own 40% of stocks. Women as consumers are a force to be reckoned with. And so both from, I, I feel like I, I, when, I, when I talk about the megatrends for women, I'm talking to two audiences. I'm talking to women and saying, hey, this is what's going on here. Use it to empower yourself. And I'm looking to the business person, be they male or female, and saying, you better study your female consumer or constituent if you're a politician know who this person is, know her values, know her vision, know her lifestyles, and she will make you very profitable. One of the points that I think you've made that, that makes absolute sense to me is that women who entered the workforce 20 years ago were not as ambitious as they needed to be. They set their goals too low. What do you have in 30 seconds to tell them how to change what they've done? It is time for every woman. At the time, it was made sense for her to set her goals now, but it's 20 years later. It's time for every woman in her 30s, 40s, and 50s to make a midlife, mid-career reassessment, to think about where she wants to be with regard to leadership. It might mean it's time for you to get that degree. It's time for you to speak out or run for public office. It may be time for you to learn how to read a financial report and, and start your own business. But really, take a reassessment, and I hope that you will decide that for you as a woman, it's time to restructure your goals, to revise your goals upward toward leadership. It's an optimistic message, and I hope our, our viewers will take it to heart. This has been Carol Spalding Minor with Patricia Aberdeen, author of Megatrends for Women, trying to share with you some of her great findings. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you.